Right, so now after having done everything we did so far, after having looked at effect size, explained variance, and sampling distribution, and thus the uh, standard error and the confidence intervals, now let's look at null hypothesis significance testing, which is what standard frequency statistic seems to be all about. Okay, and for this I want you to imagine you had a coin which you threw 30 times and it showed head 22 times. Now you have um, two people, one saying, well, this is not a fair coin because a fair coin should show 15 heads and 30 tosses. So this coin is biased because it didn't show 15. And the other person, the advocate saying um, that even a fair coin could show 22 heads and 30 tosses and this result might just be chance and this might still be a fair coin. And now using null hypothesis significant testing, significance testing, we are assuming that one of these guys is correct and we want the data to convince us otherwise. And only if we reach a certain, so the p-value now gives us how likely it is that the result occurred only by chance. So we're assuming one of these stances, so we, we're assuming the coin was fair, this being our null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis for this coin would be um, the chance of heads occurring is 0.5, the coin is fair. And then we're doing this testing and the p-value then will tell us how likely it is that the result of 22 tosses with a fair coin, of 22 heads with a fair coin, occurred only by chance. So the interpretation of p-values and testing is not easy, which is what we hear all the time from frequent statisticians, um, but it's also made overly complicated. And let's just adopt this view for now, saying that a p-value tells us how likely it is that the result occurred only by chance. And then we can ask, well, what is our chance level here? Is 5% chance, is 50% chance, is 10% chance, is 1% chance? This is the parameter we can then decide, okay? And this chance here um, just corrects for the sampling error and not for other sources of error, okay? So again, the only thing we're looking at is uh, so the only thing we can make predictions about is the sampling error, not the other sources of error. And now in classical statistics, there seem to be this, there seems to be this entire stack of tests, different tests that you can use. However, we don't want to see statistics that way. We don't want to see statistics as this set of tools which you don't understand yourself, but we want to use this computational way of doing tests that put all these statistical tests into one common framework, okay? There is only one test, as Alan Downey here says, and this is even from, um, there's still only one test, the second blog post um, regarding the same things. Okay, so the method we are using here is that we construct a computational model of our null hypothesis. In the case of our coin, that's actually really easy because a fair coin should show heads 50% of time. So we make a computational model um, of the coin that 50% of the time shows heads. Then we sample from that model sufficiently many samples. Then we calculate the statistic of interest from those samples and then we calculate the percentage of the statistic being equal or stronger than the statistics calculated from our experimental data. And this is then our p-value, okay? So we have our data and we have a model of our z of our um, edge zero um, of our null hypothesis. From this, we can simulate data. And in, this, in the case of our coin, this is simply a Bernoulli distribution. And then using this data and the simulated data, we can calculate the test statistics. And from this then, we can simply ask the question, well, where, so if we plot the distribution 
of our simulated data data from the H0, then where does our data stand? So is our data, uh, is the statistics um, of our data point an outlier um, if we look at the distribution um, of that test statistics we're looking at under the null hypothesis? Okay, I'm going to explain that. So we're going to look into an example that will hopefully make this clear. So if we get back to our fit here, what would be the null hypothesis significant test we can do? Well, let's look at the slope of our fit. And what is the null hypothesis here? The null hypothesis for our fit is that there's no relation between x and y, and thus the slope should be zero. So a model of the null hypothesis is to randomly shuffle the y data and then compute the fit on all the data because if the null hypothesis is true, then the shuffling should make no difference on the resulting slopes. Okay, so our null hypothesis says no slope and thus if the points which are right now at the right end of uh, our x spectrum are now somewhere around, then the slope should be the same. Okay, so the null hypothesis says there's no relation between x and y, meaning that y is independent of where x is. And if we now randomly shuffle these values, if there was any relationship um, from x and y, that will be destroyed by the shuffling. And if there was none, it should look roughly the same as it did before. Okay, so um, let's get this null hypothesis distribution. And to do so, well, we only shuffle here the uh, x values and then for different amounts of shuffling, so let's say we um, do 250 iterations, we then fit our ordinarily squares and then well, we get um, the parents. Let's get uh, the uh, let's get the x parent here, the slope, and now we are making a sampling distribution of the slopes of um, our fit. Okay. Uh, this takes some time, and then you have to know that starts more just a two-sided test. Uh, so we have to check whether the absolute value of a slope is bigger than the slope of our observed data, which is what we're doing here. Now, if we execute this, we see that the distribution of slopes under the H0 is like this. So, and this here is the slope um, we had in our uh, original fit. Okay, so what, how do we interpret this graph? So if we shuffle the x points, then these are the slopes we are getting. So the slopes are somewhere between zero. Most of the time they're really close to zero and sometimes they are as much as 0.5, but really only a few times of these 250 times. But the slope we calculated here um, using our fit um, was almost two. And if we're shuffling none, really, really none of um, the shuffled data points will have a slope of two. And now we don't even have to calculate a p-value for this. And we see that this is a really, really, really small p-value because it's, according to this plot, almost, or according to this plot, impossible that under the edge zero, that the position of the x values does not matter. Uh, such a slope as we experienced is possible. Okay, so we have a p-value of zero um, that the slope here is occurring only by chance, which is what our null hypothesis said. And this here is also listed here. So the p-value for this to happen by chance under the H0 is basically non-existent. This is what uh, the image here and stats models tell us. We could also calculate it. So and this here is uh, like I wrote here, 
like about here. So we're doing this two-sided test. So we have to uh, do it like this. And then we see that the p-value is 0 0.0. So now you may say generating a value of 0 twice is not uh, too hard. So let's create not so linear data with a huge variance such that we cannot see the relationship ourselves. So let's make one with not such a strong relationship to check if they actually match. So let's generate a data set which looks like this. So now I don't really see um, a relationship here. And let's let uh, stats models calculate now an ordinary squares fit for this. And now we see that we have a value x being 0.27 with a p-value of 0.14. So classical statistician would say uh, this is uh, bigger than 0.05, so it's not significant. Um, but there is some, so it says 0.27. Um, we wanted to have a slope of 0.2, so it's kind of close. And now let's um, calculate that again using our shuffling method here. And we see after the calculation is done that our computational approach or numerical approach of doing that using our shuffling um, leads to the same result almost as the analytic way that stats models used. So we see here this here is the distribution of slopes under the null hypothesis, and we see that where this is not lying, this is not as much an outlier. So if we randomly shuffle the slopes, then the slope we actually got is possible, and a couple of samples would even have a more extreme value than the slope we are having. And now, if we calculate the slope, we're going to get the if you calculate now the percentage of um, these slopes, which are uh, more extreme, we see that this is 14%, leading to a p-value of 0.141. And we see that this is almost exactly the same as the p-value which stats models told us. So using our computational way of simply shuffling uh, one of the tools from the statistics for hackers here um, from this talk, shuffling, one of the recipes for statistics for hackers, um, works just as well as the um, analytic way, where you don't understand what you're doing. And here we hopefully understood what we were doing so far. All right, and now I also have an exercise for you again, and that is to recompute the p-value using the TIPS data set of TIP against total bill using bootstrapping. Three, two, one. That's it. Let's calculate it. So here, when we did it in stats models, we saw that we had a p-value of 0 0.000. So a p-value of 0 here. And if we calculate that, um, we also have a p-value of 0. So that's, again, the same one. All right. Um, with that, we are almost done. So I wanted to show you some of the um, computational ways of how to achieve these stats models result and how to make sense of what some of the values here of stats models are telling you. Um, I'm not going to explain you more because I also don't know what the other values here are. And I don't think they're too important, to be honest, if you know the white ones you want to look at. Um, but